Hello everyone, Execadu friends and graduates. It's nice to see you again online. I'm Juana Scarlat and um, uh, welcome to a new edition of our eGrow Live Talk, a learning accelerator and an opportunity for you to learn uh, new concepts and uh, to acquire new tools. Uh, so I'm very delighted to see the interest raised on this topic. It's uh, even more important in this uh, pandemic times. Uh, leadership uh, from the inside out is our topic, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to welcome uh, our, uh, uh, our special guest uh, today uh, that is coming from uh, Spain in uh, our uh, live talk. Uh, hello, uh, Luis. Uh, welcome uh, to our Igro live talk. Hello. Uh, most welcome also from my side, and I'm delighted to be part of this uh, meeting. Great, and we also have uh, here uh, my dear colleague and mentor, uh, Simona Podgoranu, <laughs> who will be the moderator of this meeting. Joana, hello, Luis. Hello, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here today. Yes, we are uh, very, very pleased of the interest on this topic, as I said, and uh, uh, in order to e be able to broadcast on uh, social media, we'll uh, keep uh, the cameras and uh, uh, the microphones on uh, 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 closed, but uh, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to write to you uh, via chat or on uh, the Facebook comments because we will uh, address your questions. We want to be an interactive dialogue. We want to be uh, to have you involved in this uh, live meeting. So please uh, take advantage of it and uh, don't hesitate to, to interact with uh, us. So um, this micro training introduce, uh, introduces a very special course that will take uh, place in December with Luis Huete from Yesa Business School, uh, and uh, its name will be uh, Leadership, Happiness, and Fulfillment. It, it will be on uh, December 6 and 7, and we welcome you to this, uh, this amazing training. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, let us see uh, what we can discover today from uh, Luis and Simona. And uh, before we start, uh, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our speakers today. So uh, we know Luis Huete from a very long time ago, from uh, two 2004, when he, um, uh, he uh, conducted an excellent, amazing uh, workshop uh, for our graduates in uh, Sinaya. And uh, Simona was also there as an uh, organizer. Uh, yeah. You remember Simona, isn't it? <laughs> and, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and since then, uh, Luis has been uh, with us uh, several times uh, with excellent uh, results. Uh, so Luis uh, ha uh, has been a professor at ESA Business School, the famous business school in uh, Spain, uh, since uh, 1992, and uh, has also lectured in the Harvard Business School. He has been a researcher in Harvard Business School for many years, uh, years and uh, has uh, taught um, uh, Harvard Business School achieving breakthrough services and uh, in advanced uh, management programs. Uh, so uh, he has uh, participated also in other management programs uh, on five continents on famous business schools. And uh, moreover, uh, he uh, has provided training and consultancy services to more than 800 companies in 70 countries working with uh, CEOs and boards. So he has a lot of experience in working with uh, CEOs and managers and uh, leaders. Uh, his work focusing on uh, leadership strategy, uh, structure, behavior re reinforcement systems and corporate culture. Uh, Luis holds a, a law degree, an MBA from Yesa Business School and a doctoral degree in business administration from Boston University. And he's an author of uh, 12 management uh, books. Uh, and I could continue uh, a lot on this topic, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, turn on uh, Simona, who is part of Execedu team, where she is a trainer, coach, and a consultant from many, many years. And uh, her training experience is proven, is proven by a thousand of hours in a face-to-face -face or online uh, courses, leadership courses, but not only. And uh, she has inspired thousands of participants. 
She is also a successful uh, senior executive, uh, now acting as a HR director for uh, KPMG Romania and Moldova. And previously, for uh, 13 years, she has been uh, the HR director of a company with six business lines and uh, 1,200 employees. Uh, in uh, 2019, she was awarded for excellent training performance uh, with a bronze award after the vote of uh, over uh, 600 HR managers. Uh, she had also graduated the uh, uh, top management program at uh, Yesa Barcelona, which uh, links uh, her uh, even more with Luis, and also other uh, business school, uh, Harvard, uh, uh, Heck Moral, and, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, thank you, Simona, for having patience uh, with me to present to you because I know that you don't like it too much. And uh, please, uh, I pass the floor to you to uh, conduct this amazing uh, learning experience for everyone. Thank you, Ana, for this presentation. Um, indeed, I am very, very happy uh, to be here and thank you for this invitation too because uh, uh, I think, Luis, I told you already many times uh, that it is a topic that I'm very much uh, fond of. Uh, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to discuss uh, with you on, on such a topic, as I really consider that uh, leadership inside out today is not uh, about uh, how we manage people or even less or more accurate, uh, it is very little about uh, how to manage people, but it is more about how we can master an ongoing internal growth process that will impact on ourselves and other people, of course. So uh, being uh, myself very passionate uh, about contributing to my personal growth, but also to the growth of, of other people, as you, as you can imagine, I have uh, read and participated in many researches on leadership skills. And also I see our markets really invaded on books on personal development that uh, every book almost promises uh, us mastery of the leadership once we end uh, these books uh, to be read. But the reality actually shows that uh, in most of the cases, it just doesn't work. And uh, we have promised uh, Luis together in, uh, in our presentation that uh, until the end of our meeting today, we will give to the audience at least one tool that will work yeah. uh, and we will do that. I trust we will do that. Also, I know you have prepared many tools uh, during the, the training uh, itself, but yeah. today we will give also tools. Uh, what I propose you, Louise, is before going to the to tools and uh, anything else uh, in the meeting, uh, I feel the need to clarify for, for our guests also, what are we talking about today? So if you can tell us, what do you understand by leadership inside out? Wonderful. Hey, listen, this is an important issue eh? because um, many times we have to ask ourselves what is going on inside each one of us before we harm others or even we harm ourselves. Eh? And uh, basically what I understand by this leadership is that we have had very powerful resources inside ourselves that uh, do have to be managed, do have to be lead, so to speak. And uh, this leadership is very much about how can I, how can I use for the best eh, all the inner resources? Uh, and inner resources happen to be uh, my intelligence, my kindness, my will. Eh? Those three things together can create a tremendous power of initiative, of um, uh, creativity, of um, being able to, to make possible the impossibles. And we've seen so many people eh, that uh, in tremendously negative circumstances, they've been able to grow, they've been able to use well those resources, that I think those are a very compelling, so to speak, um, example for all of us to learn from them. Eh? Because uh, I think that the, the more we use those inner resources for, uh, for, two, for two purposes, eh? uh, for personal growth and for contribution. Eh? We, we will talk about this, but I mean, we strongly believe that there is a very interesting self enforcement process between giving and growing. And uh, we tend to say, hey, 
the more you give, the more you grow, the more you grow, the more you can give. And those are sort of uh, the, the logic that uh, we, I think that is very important that we install uh, leadership in that logic. Yeah. So that, you have said it, I want to hold you a little bit here because uh, uh, you, you have said it uh, already, uh, uh, the type of information that I wanted to, to stress <laughs> about. But I know, Luis, that you did uh, your uh, researches, in your researches, uh, comprehensive uh, examination of effective leaders. And you, you just mentioned it before. Uh, so you have many insights to identify leadership patterns. Mm -hmm. So um, what I would like to even stress more than you said it already is uh, what would you say that it is foundational to the most effective results producing leaders? So which are the essential patterns that you have identified in great leaders? Well, we can talk hours on that. Yeah. So let me give you at least uh, three how can I say, three models or three ways through which we can conceptualize that. Um, by the way, first idea is, hey, effectiveness and efficiency. Yeah? Because I think that a great leader is someone that is effective in making decisions and is efficient in uh, execution. And I think that also this first model is effectiveness, efficiency in the short term and in the long term. And this is why this model that I will explain more in December says, hey, there is four vitamins that are part of leadership. One is uh, what we call the red vitamin, so give you vitality. And this red vitamin is all about determination to execute. This is short-term effectiveness. And this is you are pushy, you know how to organize things, you are on top of uh, short-term results, you sort of uh, have uh, um, an idea of uh, which are the, the, the tools that you have to use to get things done. This is the red vitamin. Then we have the what is called the blue vitamin, which is the rigorousness to administrate. And this is short-term efficiency. Hey, effectiveness, efficiency, we've got now two areas of personal development, so to speak. Then we have uh, the third area of, uh, of personal development, so to speak, that is uh, what we call the green vitamin that gives you vitality to do well. Something that is more and more important is the human sensitivity to integrate. Meaning by integration, um, alignment, uh, collaboration, uh, teaming, uh, creating values uh, around yourself. And this for us is long-term efficiency. And then there is a fourth area of development, so to speak, uh, that is, or uh, for area is typical from sort of effective and efficient uh, leaders is what we call the yellow uh, vitamin. And the yellow vitamin is the creativity to become an entrepreneur, is to, uh, not an entrepreneur per se, but to do new things, to be, to be able to innovate, to be able to be more creative. Okay? And again, this is long-term effectiveness. Hey, and then our message is very interesting. How good you are in yellow, meaning long-term effectiveness, will give you a clue of how good will you be in the future in short-term effectiveness. And the same with green. How good you are in green, that sensitive to integrate diversity give you an idea of how efficient would you be in the in the short in the long term in the way you do things so that's one way through which I, we love to because that's uh, training people to develop those vitamins and how to make it compatible and uh, how to create a team that is perfect meaning by perfect in which you've got the four vitamins very high in a team and they know how to work together I think this is critical. So this is one of the models that we use. Another model that we use is uh, the one that was developed at Stanford some years ago. I re remember this uh, Jim Collins saying, hey, there is level five. Level five is someone that is uh, admired because in some areas he or she is above average. Second is someone that is uh, knows how to manage people, knows how to understand people, knows how to listen, knows how to empathize. 
Third is someone that is very resolutive, yeah, so knows how to make decision you know, under uncertainty. Fourth is someone with charisma. And fifth is someone with uh, that on top of that is humble and has a strong determination. So that's another way through which you can look at the same issue. And then the third model that I tend to use is the one that was developed by my friend Tom DeLong in, at Harvard Business School that says also that uh, good leaders tend to do well five things. One is they set a very good personal example. Second is that uh, they know how to uh, set the direction. So it's more the what, less the how. Third is they are on top of execution so that they know what happened with, with things. Fourth is that he is a good bridge uh, we, uh, between people that tend not to work well together. And then the fifth thing that they do or they have to do well is creating a strong belief that together that team can do great things. So that was a long Sorry. answer. Uh, that. <laughs> it sounds very easy, Luis. <laughs> but those are the ideas that I try to work with uh, when, I, when I happen to be in front of uh, executive teams. So I, I take uh, I take it from here. So I, what I understand is, uh, if you want to become a great leader, don't forget to take your vitamins. This is what it is important. So uh, uh, growth, yeah. yeah. And then and then uh, don't forget to, while taking your vitamins, don't forget to be uh, the five uh, level leader. Uh, yeah. That means being humble and uh, understand uh, what what does it mean for you and for the others. And also uh, the five things that you have to, to keep in mind. Uh, staying with this, I want to challenge you a little bit more because um, um, as you can imagine, I, I did read all your researches and your articles <laughs> uh, on uh, leadership. And um, I remember uh, this link between leadership and the advice that you receive when, when you are in a plane. Uh, in the improbable cause of depressurization of the plane, put your oxygen mask first. Yes. So they are saying, put your oxygen mask first, not to your child, not to your strongest partner, yeah. but to you first. And then I read in your, uh, in your uh, articles, uh, in one of them, you say the greatness of leadership is expressed in service to others. So Luis, how do you see that in comparison with put your oxygen mask first? Which one should be first, yourself or others? And why? Beautiful the question and uh, tricky, but uh, as you know, there is uh, those two things can come together. Eh? Basically, uh, the philosophy is that the more you have, the more you can give. Eh? Uh, so basically, if you want to live a life of service, uh, you better sort of start growing yourself because the more you have, the more you give, eh? and the. The interesting thing is that also psychologically, is the more you give, the more you grow. So mm -hmm. at the end, it's not a question of one or the other. It's a question of how to create a, what is called a symbiotic a relationship between those two elements, service and personal growth. Okay? And uh, yes, you are right. I think that uh, probably from, the, um, from, from some point of view is, hey, start with yourself and then kind of... Uh, move more into the service. But also at the same time, you can argue that uh, uh, a life of service is, uh, is forced you to a life of personal growth. So my message is work on both, uh, make a symbiotic relationship between uh, personal growth and, uh, and, and contribution. And by the way, those two things tend to be totally related with, uh, with, um, with uh, happiness and with uh, fulfillment. And uh, this is a very fulfillment, as you know, is a very, so to speak, sustainable feeling. Eh? It's a feeling of worth. It's a feeling that of gratitude. It's a feeling of uh, that uh, what you are doing is meaningful for you. And that is tremendously attractive as, as, as all of you know. Hmm? Now, this makes me remember, uh, I don't know uh, uh, where I, I saw that, but for me, it was uh, very relevant and it helped me to make decisions uh, in life. I remember someone saying, make, make always good to yourself without hurting others, but make good to others without hurting yourself. Beautiful. If those two are not going together, 
this is something wrong and you have to revise what you want to do. Beautiful. So uh, I think it's very close to, to what you are saying. And for me, it was really helpful when I was in doubt uh, whether to do something. I was, I was always trying to understand, is, does this uh, bring me something good? Yes, checked. Does this hurt anybody? No, checked. And the other way around. So, uh, yes, I, I relate very much to, to what uh, you are saying. Simona, uh, you, know, you know that I love uh, two by two metrics. Eh? So yeah. uh, with those uh, two variables that you just mentioned, you can create a two by two metrics. Is doing good, uh, doing good or, or hurt you and others are good and hurt. So you've got four things. The worst thing that you can do is hurt yourself and hurt the others. others. By the way, we do that from time to time. Uh, and then the best thing is uh, doing something that simultaneously that's good for you and for others. Yeah, and then you've got the other two situations. So very good. Yes, I love it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I loved it too. And also uh, when you said that, uh, that uh, sometimes we are, we are hurting ourselves and we are hurting others. Well, actually, it's as crazy as it sounds. We, we are doing this uh, many times without being aware. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, it, is Im it is important, let's say, to understand. So coming back to that, um, when you refer to leadership inside, inside out, you speak about five personal battles. You speak about focus. You speak about interpretation, about emotional state, about self-imposed standards, and about routine and time allocation. And I propose you to, to take them one by one um, in order to understand them more because I found them meaningful and, and very interesting. And um, I would start with focus because um, when, I, when I saw your, your model, I was thinking that personally, I find more difficult than focus to understand what you should focus on. So for me, uh, not necessarily the problem is the focus, but uh, is to understand my purpose uh, and of course then my objectives and I find those quite confusing from time to time and I will give you an example I was thinking that um, if you if you ask what is the purpose of, of a football team or any other team the answer immediate answer would be to win the game to to beat the the other uh, the the competition to beat the the others and if you ask another question what's the objective for the team um, you may most probably get the same type of answer, you know, uh, so win the game. So um, very often we find there is a confusion between what we consider to be a purpose and what we consider to be an objective. So the purpose, I know that it is the reason why, why the business exists, why uh, do I exist, why uh, the team actually does what it does. And the objectives is what it is need to be done in order to achieve the goals. So um, having in mind that, uh, or my struggle, let's say, uh, I would ask what is the better um, um, uh, for a leader when it comes to focus and how would you link focus with purpose and objectives? Very good. So let me uh, rephrase what you said. Um, Purpose is the why, and then uh, probably the objective is the what and the how. And mm, the interesting thing is that if we put those things together, by the way, uh, the why in, in, in the model that I tend to use is more a yellow, is the, is the purpose, is the why. Yeah? So it's more the long-term effectiveness. Then the what and the how in our model is more short-term, uh, the what is effectiveness and the how is efficiency. Hey, and as always, you want things to be integrated. You want the how, the what, and the why, and even the whom, something that um, integrate well, well it, with, with themselves. Eh? Because the better the integration, the, 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 the better the ecosystem, the, the more functionality you get about those, those things. And um, before jumping into the focus that I will do in a minute, let me put that into the context. You, you talk about bottles and, uh, and as you know, there is this Simon Sinek that came with this concept or he 
popularized a concept that was already there, that is that the infinite game. Eh? Meaning by infinite game that uh, life is full of battles, meaning by battles, um, I don't know, I mean, just the budget, uh, it's just hey, how to sort of uh, get things done, is uh, uh, a negotiation. Those are bottles that happen to be, uh, most of them finite, meaning by this, that they don't take many time, many years or it takes a short period of time. And meaning by this, that most of them, we already know the rules on how to handle or how to, so to speak, to win those battles. But then the interesting thing is that uh, he remarks that there is something uh, along with the battles that happen to be called the infinite game. Let's call it the real war. And that is uh, whom you become, whom you become as a leader, whom you become as a person while you try to win the battles of life. And uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, hey, the important thing is the infinite game. The infinite game is whom you become because the infinite game is, is what is going to allow you to win most of the most important battles. And then also he claims that the infinite game is, hey, it's going to last your whole life. And even when you die, as you know, there is uh, two ways through which we die. One is a physical death. And then there is also, a, a, how you said, a spiritual death that is when no one just remember you when uh, whatever you have done in life is, is gone eh? because it hasn't survived. So basically they say, hey, let's play the infinite game eh? because the infinite game is, is the most intelligent approach to life eh? because the infinite game is uh, trying to get the best version of yourself and trying to stay in that best version of yourself mm, the longer you can. That's great because you will see that winning that infinite game is very much about what we are talking is about fulfillment. It's about sort of sustainable happiness and the like. So this is, and then I develop a model that says, if you want to win the infinite game, there is five key battles in your life that we will go through them now that uh, you have to sort of uh, keep winning them because you will see that they, they uh, relate one with another and uh, we are going to start with focus but they are all self-reinforcing with the fourth with the fifth the fourth with the third the second with the one so it's we put it a little bit linear but those are sort of an ecosystem of variables that are key to so to speak to to keep sort of winning because that's going to uh, create the condition in which most of us can uh, stay quite a bit of our life in, in, in this best, best version of ourselves. So basically with the number one is focus. Focus is where you put your mind uh, because there are so many things that you can put your mind. And basically focus, you can manage focus through at least two, two variables. One is uh, through the question that you ask to yourself. As you know, questions happen to be orders to your brain. So if you keep asking intelligent questions, basically then your brain will focus on those, on trying to answer those questions. And then, as you know, there is also something that we have in our brain uh, that is the reticular system that is uh, like a radar that we have. And basically this is what, whatever we desire strongly, the reticular system, and up sort of looking for information that are related with what we strongly want. Okay? So basically you will see that the focus, and again, that's a combination is when uh, we, uh, and that has happened to us at least for me many times when I was uh, sort of uh, searching for, hey, what is the new car that I should be buying? And I had two or three candidates in my head. Uh, typically I was much more aware of, uh, of seeing those cars around, why? Well, not because they didn't exist before, but because my reticular system was sort of a, a wire eh? uh, to find that sort of information. So basically with the focus is very much uh, is, uh, is choosing where you put your attention. 
is directing and is much more intelligent to put your attention on things that, that happen to be positive than not just negative. It's putting your attention on things that you can't control, not on things that you cannot control. Putting your attention on, on the present and on the future, not on the past. Those are things that can be trained. And uh, part of uh, creating the best version of ourselves is we have to command or, 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 uh, or focus. Okay? We have to be the one that are able to develop a capability in which we can concentrate. We know what we want and uh, we redirect our mind to those things that end up creating that sort of uh, 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 capability to, to go beyond where we are in, in topics that do have uh, uh, potential or you know, do have interest for us. This is focus. Thank you, Luis, and you, um, I loved it. Uh, focus is where you put your mind and, and, and on what you concentrate. And it is very interesting. Uh, I remember that um, uh, we can discuss about uh, four level uh, in which people in, in certain moment of life that they, they, they may be. And uh, it is one level that is called, I am what I have. And in this level, people are putting their mind on how they can accumulate more. How can I take the red car or how can I, how, how can I make money? And it's not something bad behind because I want to make money for my kids to have for the education. And uh, you have very good intention behind it. So what, and this, this would be at the first level and it's very important where you are now, where do you, where you put your mind now? And the second level is um, uh, I am um, how the others are seeing me that I am. So I am seeing myself and I put the focus on what is, uh, or which is the, the, uh, the way that other people are seeing me. Mm. Uh, third level is uh, I am what I do. And uh, from the moment that you lose your job or you don't do what uh, you do, and that's why we go sometimes workaholic and we don't understand that we fill our life with, with lots of work because it is about I am what I do. When I stop doing, I stop being. Mm. And this is another, another thing. And, and the fourth level, it is I am who I am. Yeah. Uh, and you have to solve all the three levels in order to reach the fourth one. And it, yeah. for me, during my life, it was interesting uh, uh, to have awareness on which level I, I was, because this was really helping me to, to reach, uh, to evaluate, to evolve on that and to, to go from a level to, to another and to be conscious about it. Uh, and this remind me of uh, this struggle that I saw in many people uh, and how important it was for, for, for us, for them to see where are we now on yeah. what we are putting our focus actually. Beautiful. No, and I think that the, as you know, there is also a model that uh, complements the one that you said that is the worst thing that can happen to any of us is to create uh, many uh, what we call emotional dependencies. Yeah. Is that, uh, hey, the way you think about yourself is depending on who, what you have, depends on uh, what others think about you, depends on your work. I mean, this is very human, and uh, but this is dependency. Eh? So mm -hmm. there is a second stage that is wonderful that is independence, is that, hey, I am who I am. Uh, no matter that I have more or less uh, tools or uh, toys or uh, that I have uh, better or worse, so to speak, uh, uh, job of whatever. And then the third stage that is what we call interdependence. And interdependence is wonderful, is, uh, but interdependence is based on independence. So in the, the, to, to, to become really interdependent, to really create a wonderful relationship with, with your company, with your colleagues, with your clients, with your uh, uh, spouse or with uh, is, is through independent and through, I mean, uh, I've reached already that level four that you said before, because from there on, I can create a symbiotic relationship that happened to be the best, that is, is that is tend to be also really correlated with happiness. Yes, and uh, this is uh, also important because uh, we know that we are uh, up to a level uh, and, and it, it takes to our, it is linked to our maturity or uh, being, being dependent on others then we want so much to be independent of others. And yeah. then we start to understand that actually interdependency, it is something that really creates, a, um, let's say, the equilibrium that we are 
searching yeah. so much for. Yeah. And because we are here, Luis, uh, can you tell us a tool or an example uh, in order to maintain or to increase our capacity to focus? Uh, I would say that um, one, one piece of advice that I want to share with you is uh, the number one distractor for uh, all of us tend to be social networks. Mm -hmm. So typically what we recommend also to, to have more focus or uh, to concentrate on, on work is to turn down or off the notification of your uh, telephone or uh, of your uh, of, uh, of your iPads and the like, because uh, the fact that uh, you are not interrupted by notification, by emails and the like, and that you end up just looking at them whenever you want. I think this is a great small way through which uh, you can focus. And then the second piece of advice that I will say is, hey, why don't you write the things that you still have to do in life? Eh? The things that you really think that are reachable, that uh, you really think that are worth to to fight for them, that uh, you think that uh, hey you you are capable to, but they are difficult, but at the same time they are sort of uh, reachable, and uh, why don't you read that very often? Eh? That's something that uh, also you can put it in your computer or you can put it into your uh, electronic agenda, so that at least every week you spend 10, 15, 20 minutes on, uh, on uh, feeling and sensing those ideas, because that is one way through which we can calibrate this, uh, as I said, this uh, part of the brain that is the reticular system. And that's one way through which indirectly our mind will become much more focused. You, you please try on that. Yes, I know that sometimes uh, small steps uh, or things that are so obvious, they are uh, and simple. They are the ones that give us most of the results. So what you are saying in order to increase focus is try to eliminate all interruptions that are not related to, to what you are focusing on. So yeah. being these inter interruptions, uh, social media or uh, whatever. And uh, um, I, I remember that I read the Atomic Habits uh, this is a very good book to create uh, good behaviors. And uh, in Atomic Habits, uh, it was given an example, quite simple, said, you know what, if you want to lose some weight, um, you don't have to start to, uh, to do all kinds of, uh, you know, crazy rules. It's good to, to be informed. But one thing you have to identify, if you say that I am a person that is at the diet, that means you recognize that uh, you are not there. But if you, if you recognize that I am a person that wants to live a healthy life, then whenever you, want, you are in front of some cakes or something and you say, what, what the person that wants to, to live a healthy life would do now? Would this person take all the cakes here? And maybe the answer is obvious. If you are following or not, <laughs> this is another thing. So what you're saying is if, if I am, if I am um, uh, recognizing myself as a person that wants to focus, it is a very simple question. Ask yourself what a person that wants to focus on something would do. So one small step is stop inter yeah. interruptions. Yeah, Simona, and uh, as you know, uh, uh, we tend to imitate. Eh? We have yes. a brain that uh, tend to imitate uh, what we have around. And I think that what you were suggesting is very smart, is, hey, I, why why don't you imitate best practices? Why don't you yes. imitate those people that have solved that problem? And uh, through that, that's a great learning, so to speak, uh, journey. Correct. But I want to go to the to the second battle because uh, I am aware of time and I don't want to, okay. to lose it. And uh, you are discussing about the second battle being interpretation. Yeah. Tell us a well, bit more about it. Yeah, interpretation is meaning. Eh? Interpretation is uh, the story that you tell to yourself. Eh? And uh, you know that uh, most of us do have uh, what we call, how you said, two, um, two stories about ourselves. Eh? One that uh, is more self-doubting is that sort of a story that we tell, a storytelling about ourselves in which there is, uh, well, there is limitation, there is uh, defeat, there is frustration. This is what we call uh, self-doubting. Uh, story. So it is just me that does not uh, hear Luis anymore, or is... yeah, can you hear me well? I yes, hear you. We hear you. Yes. Yeah, I hear you very well. 
We hear you also. Okay. So that might be you, Simona. So Joanna, should I continue? Can you hear me? Yes, please. We are hearing you very well. Yeah. Very good. Hey, so I was uh, talking about this uh, interpretation, eh? uh, meaning by interpretation, uh, this meaning that we attach to things. And uh, I was saying that there is an inner voice eh, that uh, we have a sort of an inner voice that tend to tell us two stories. One is a self-doubting story about ourselves, and then there is another that is called the self-affirmative self story about ourselves. That second one, self-affirmative, is the one that, hey, we have to make it sort of uh, the one that is behind uh, the, the meaning that we attach to things. This second bottle is very important because things are objective, but also things are according to how we see them. Eh? And uh, as you know, we stress very much the idea that the story that you tell to yourself happened to be the life that you end up living. So it's very interesting because uh, this is why many experts had said that Life is not what happened to you, it's how you react to what happened to you. Okay? If we are able to create even a meaningful meaning, okay? a powerful meaning, even to difficulties, then from our, for our brain, that's not a negative circumstances. That's an empowering circumstance. So first is focus, second is meaning, and uh, we do have, but then for meaning, you have to have a very strong belief system. And you have also to have a very powerful, so to speak, personal story. That is, uh, all of us do have the two stories, the self-doubting and the self-affirmative, but your self-affirmative story has to be very strong. Sorry, I was muted, of I, course. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I would add here, uh, Luis, uh, this thought patterns or self-narrative that we are saying ourselves, and these thought patterns, some of them are shaped in childhood and affect our relationship as adults. Uh, and sometimes we are aware, sometimes yeah. we are not. And awareness, it is the first step in order to, to understand that it is something to do about it. Because we have this, um, um, the, the most frequent that I've heard with managers that I that I am working and not only with people around me and with myself from time to time is, for example, this emotional deprivation talk, like I never get enough love or I never get enough caring or self-sacrificing talk. I am always giving a lot from myself to others and I the other side just don't see it enough. So many times we do not realize how much they impact us negatively in, in our in our lives. And uh, it's important this interpretation, but first it is to start you now with with uh, how what I, what I'm telling to myself when I'm talking to myself, because uh, you can you can change the language in order to change the thinking, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and I totally agree with you. This is a key area. Uh, typically. Uh, there are three people that had impacted in our self-narrative. They tend to be our parents. Then they tend to be also one uh, professor in high school. And then tend to be also our first uh, sort of boss in uh, when we start working. Eh? So it's very important also that awareness of this self-narrative because uh, part of it is we have to enrich it. We have to enrich that self-narrative because our brain doesn't distinguish what is real to what is what we tell them, what, what we are telling to ourselves. So basically what I'm, what I'm saying is something that uh, we all know, but uh, whenever you say something negative about something, it's, for, it's, it's, as, it's as if it was happening again. So this mm -hmm. is why it's so important to work well with our memory, with uh, our imagination, because at the end our, our brain is plastic and uh, you change your brain according to what you think, what you imagine, what you feel, and that uh, you want to create sort of a, a, you are going to spend the, the rest of your life in your brain, so to speak, in your, uh, in your uh, intellectual. So you, we better create a nice home eh, for us because we are going to be living there for the rest of our life. 
Yes, this was very nice. So it is about awareness. What do we yeah. talk to ourselves? Create a new self narrative. So actually, what it is to be done is talk back to your self talk. Yeah. <laughs> talk back to your self talk and uh, talk it in a way that brings you value, uh, yeah. not that puts you down. Yeah. Uh, Simona, as you know, uh, as as leaders, we are we tend to be very good, or as manager, we tend to be very good in cost benefit analysis. Hey, what is the cost? Eh? What is the potential benefit of this? Hey, we have to apply the same with our thinking. What is the cost benefit of uh, telling me that? Eh? And uh, probably the cost is very high and the value is very low if we keep sort of uh, reinforcing that negative that negative narrative. So uh, let's go to the other battle. Okay. Um, the, we have uh, the emotional state battle and I found it very uh, interesting uh, actually during this period of time because we all know that the uh, COVID crisis places us uh, in a unique scenario and we have no previous similar experience and we are working without references. We are learning while we are doing that, but it is a sort of stress that we, cannot, we, we, we have to figure it out and to acknowledge it. So um, uh, the duration and extent of uh, both uh, the social and economic impact of the pandemic, uh, it is unknown. Um, and it has expanded uh, at an unprecedented speed. Um, so um, this does not look very helpful in controlling our emotional state. Yeah. So how, how do you define and how we can win the emotional uh, state battle? Emotional state, as you know, happen to be energy. Eh? Uh, the way you feel in a being energy. And uh, there is positive or negative energy. There is a uh, high intensity or low intensity uh, energy. And there is a strong evidence that uh, negative uh, emotions with uh, high intensity are very dysfunctional for decision making. Uh, so you tend to make many mistakes because there is a strong connection between brain and uh, heart, so to speak. Eh? So there is also a lot of uh, research that shows that when people make take the best decision, when their uh, intelligence become more practical, is when you feel positive at medium, eh? medium, medium, high intensity, positive. Uh, that's the energy gives you more sort of... Uh, uh, power eh, to, to, to use well all the inner resources. And here is my message. My message is that through focus and through meaning, eh, so it's battle one and battle two, uh, you win battle three. So mm -hmm. battle three by itself, mm, you cannot, uh, you have to work on the focus and you have to work on the meaning, uh, meaning by this, the narrative and the like. And then uh, that awareness that uh, the cost benefit of being in positive uh, emotional, uh, positive high medium uh, um, emotional energy, positive emotional energy, the cost benefit is tremendous. And this is why, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, you can train yourself. And uh, as you know, there are habits. There are habits in the way you think. There are habits in the way you feel. And there are habits in the way you behave. The three are connected. But the message is the, the same. The more you repeat, the easier will be the next time for the good and for the bad. So again, to be uh, to, to try to hear our uh, and understand our emotional state yeah. and uh, be aware of it. And then uh, we can we can work with it. This, yeah. this is again about, uh, of course, self-awareness. Um, I would go to, to battle number four. Mm -hmm. uh, the self-imposed standards. Yeah. So tell us more. Yeah. Battle number four happened to be related number three. Uh, number three is feelings. Is that uh, is uh, hey you feel strong positive emotion, but then how to use that? And then here comes the battle number four, mm -hmm. that is hey be smart. Okay? Use that yeah. energy. Use that drive. Uh, that is part of battle three. And one, one and two for number four, because number four is you set to yourself um, high standards. Uh, you said to yourself uh, in what is important in life, eh, depending on your model, but uh, typically is uh, you said to yourself high standards in, in renewing your energy, uh, intellectual, uh, physical, emotional, and spiritual 
energy. So you said to yourself standards uh, that you self-impose to yourself so that uh, at the end uh, you end up sort of be relatively demanding on yourself because you want excellence eh? and because, uh, so to speak, you uh, for you, good is not enough. Eh? And most in, in the important thing, if you can, you want to be really excellent. And this is bottle number four, is use that energy from bottle number three to uh, become more self-demanding in areas that uh, happen to be investment in life, investment in your future happiness, investment in your future personal growth, investment in your future contribution. That's the best way through which you can use that positive energy of bottle number three. You know what, is, what I feel very difficult uh, in here, uh, Luis, and I need, uh, I need to, to hear also uh, your opinion about it, about this instant gratification. Yeah. Hey, I deserve it. Uh, I'm working a lot. I want to feel well. So um, these self-imposed standards are really bothering me from time to time because I have high standards. Uh, I, I, I am demanding for myself and uh, uh, I don't know if for others, but from time to time, I feel the need of instant gratification. So tell us a bit about it. Yeah, uh, wonderful. And as you know, the um, gratification, talking about gratification is talking about dopamine. It is yes. wonderful hormone that uh, is behind almost what we do. Eh? But basically, uh, and I've, I do have a graphic that uh, we will work in that seminar that is, uh, th there is short-term gratification and long-term gratification. Okay. So there are things that provide you short-term and long-term gratification, like, uh, I don't know, walking in a beautiful forest from Romania. Hey, my voice is wonderful. I mean, if this is a habit that's going to be good for you now, it's going to be good for you in the future. There are some issues that give you short-term gratification, but will not give you long-term gratification. Typically, hey, if you rob, hey, if you sort of lie, if you sort of uh, manipulate people, uh, if you drink too much, that's going to provide you a lot of short-term gratification because you will think that you are very smart or you think that there is hey, a sensation. But typically there are some short-term gratification, some of them that happen to be, as uh, Shakespeare explained very well in his work, that uh, is part of your future decadence happen to be related with those with some short-term gratification. Then there are some issues that, that doesn't provide any short-term gratification, like studying or uh, like uh, doing exercise at the beginning. Hey, this is no gratification at all, but hey, those are, that will bring long-term gratification. So basically what I'm saying is that uh, be aware that with a short-term thinking, you, will, you, won't, you won't be able to differentiate gratification that are good now and in the future with gratification that are okay now but are not going to provide you gratification in the future you are not going to distinguish and non-gratification now but that will bring gratification in the future and then my message is the following hey work you have to lead the short term and the long term and so it's a keep not just uh, and, uh, and there is a strong evidence also from this psychiatric point of view is that uh, the if you provide to your life a lot of meaning then uh, you need less uh, sensations yeah? and basically also what I read from some author is that uh, we are creating a society in which there is we are creating a lot of addiction to uh, short-term gratification Meaning by this that we need a lot of noise, a lot of doing things, a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, short-term gratification that are spectacular to feel good. And then typically this is at the cost of what is called the long-term dopamine. Eh? And the long-term dopamine tend to be associated with meaning, with meaning, with sacrifice, because uh, there is a reason to do it that has to do with uh, the effort to train myself that's also gratification, but that's long-term gratification. And then the, the danger is that we create what is called a crowding out effect. Crowding out effect is, oh, life is so full of sensations that at the end, uh, we, we don't work on what really is important. important. 
what is more sustainable that are things that yeah. are not the massage, yeah. it's not the food, it's not the trip, it's, it's, it's more the meaning, it's more the responsibility, it's more all the things that will provide, will bring to your life a lot of gratification, but this long-term gratification is much more sustainable, it's much more under control, and in that sense, uh, it uh, makes you much more uh, free eh, to choose. Okay, so we are on the Fifth battle, routines and time allocation. And yeah. my question is, uh, Luis, is still even possible today when we work from home near, near our families with changes in school programs? In Romania, Ministry of Education just has announced that two weeks holiday for primary school pupils instead of one, effective immediately. But work, some colleagues demand to work from home while others started to show signs of depression for working remotely. So what do you recommend us to do with this, to win this battle? Well, I, I, I would recommend, and again, I know that, uh, hey, I better apply that to myself first, is, hey, whatever is a difficulty, uh, look for the opportunity behind that. Uh, look for the potential meaning that this will have. Look that uh, there is, this happened not to you, this happened for you. Okay? Because if you keep thinking that uh, this is happening for me, and this is, uh, this is an opportunity for growth, uh, Hey, the, then you will make that negative circumstances uh, uh, an event or 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 a spring a spring hole for uh, for personal growth. I love this. This is happening for me, and not this is happening to me. To me. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the time. I would stay and debate more. <laughs> as all this discussion is really interesting, um, and uh, you gave us excellent insights. But I'm aware of time. So my last question uh, is, if you have to choose two stop actions and two start actions to do in order to become uh, a happy or fulfilled inside out leader, what this would be or those okay. would be? Well, I will say that uh, stop this self-doubting narrative. Okay? And uh, it, it will exist, but try to stop it so that I uh, end up having a less... Uh, market share of your mind. Okay? That's uh, one recommendation. Then second recommendation is also stop uh, suffering. And meaning by this, as you know, uh, there is a difference between pain and suffering. Uh, pain is inevitable. Many times has to be welcome because that's part of life. But then uh, life is, uh, but then suffering, suffering is something that uh, it's, it's evitable eh? and because suffering is that you attach to something a negative meaning or a meaning that makes you a victim or makes you sort of a frustration and the like. And so stop that because this is very toxic that you don't want to fool your mind and your heart with toxicity eh? because then that will be expressed in your attitudes that will be expressed in the way you do things. Then uh, if I had to recommend start something is um, a start. You know that most of the conflicts in life tend to be what we call conflicts of rules. Meaning by this, that I do have an expectation, I do have a rule, and then someone else, according to that rule, uh, he or she doesn't sort of uh, comply. Eh? And then this is bringing me a little bit of uh, anger and frustration. So basically, start simplifying the rules through which you work on life. Eh? And uh, try also to make sure that the people that work along with you, we do have similar rules in the issues that are uh, in which we have to collaborate. Because the more alignment of rules, the more functional functional relationship that we will develop. Eh? And basically what I'm saying is that many times, hey, we, we, we are not clear on the rules, what we expect from others and what others expect from us. And basically simplify that because if you keep sort of adding uh, more rules and uh, more complex rules, then uh, you're not going to be happy easily. Eh? You're not going to be fulfilled uh, easily. And then also if I recommend you something to start is keep, keep Starting meaning uh, keep keep doing more of uh, forgiveness. As you know, forgiveness is one wonderful way 
through which we can liberate energies. And I will say that also start uh, doing better griefing. Griefing, as you know, is that process through which uh, you are not attached to things from the past. The more things that you happen to be attached from things from the past, the less future you have. So basically, if you want to have a better future, is keep sort of cutting those uh, things that eventually are at tying you with the past with negative so to speak experiences and the like so that's my advice thank you and uh i want to hear more about it so i will be in your training course louise uh, so uh, waiting uh, waiting uh, to see you back with us thank you for today it was uh, an excellent discussion i i thank you and i give the floor to anna very good Hello again. Uh, we, um, well, meanwhile, uh, we uh, encourage you to address uh, your questions uh, because uh, we already have one from uh, the public, and uh, I will uh, ask uh, Simona to uh, to take it. And uh, uh, before uh, that, uh, please allow me to uh, share with the public the fact that we will have a, a, a training with you. Uh, the subject is uh, leadership, happiness, and the fulfillment. It will be on uh, December 6th and uh, 7th, and uh, uh, we have a presentation uh, of uh, this uh, this uh, amazing uh, course. Uh, let me share it with you. Can you hear it? Okay. The good news is that we have a very special prize uh, for those who are uh, together uh, with us this evening. It's uh, 350 euros instead of uh, 400, 150 euros. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, write us uh, up to tomorrow for uh, this uh, special prize. And now uh, let's go back to the questions because uh, there are uh, many more. Uh, and Simona has the... Uh, has the um, I have the floor. No, yes, to choose yes. The, some of the most relevant of it. Uh, so, uh, Louise, I, I have seen just uh, two questions, but I will dig more to see if we have. So, question from social media. How do you create trust relationship with your team members when you are managing remotely? How do you engage them in teamwork when they are working alone in their homes? Well, I brought an article on this, so uh, that will be part of the package of the program that uh, we will be putting together in, in December. Uh, but basically, let me say that trust is based on four elements. And I think that four elements can be also, um, can, 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 can be channeled also through online. Eh? One is uh, credibility. So I think that uh, the, you tend to develop trust when uh, you happen to be credible. And I think that that's something that uh, right, credibility is something that comes with whom you are, comes with your past performance, and eventually it's something that even in, in online can be sort of, uh, can, can be worked. Second thing is reliability. So trust tend to be also 
uh, connected with how reliable you are. And again, with online, it's, it's also something that you can uh, still uh, sort of work on it eh? because reliability is that, uh, hey, um, you're punctual. Whenever you said that you are going to be doing something, you do it. It's, it's, uh, it's how accurate you are in, in the work you do. So those things can be also channeled through online. Third element that is related with trust is empathy. Yeah, and this is a little bit more difficult through online because typically when you happen to be with someone there is more information, you can be more empathic, but also I think that on, through online, hey, I've been, uh, I haven't seen you for uh, years, but I mean, I was preparing this talk, I'm preparing the seminar. I mean, I feel much more closer to you without being with you. Eh? And um, so, yeah, more difficult, but still can be done. And then the fourth element that is related with trust is the absence of ego. I Meaning by this, hey, how others perceive uh, that, how willingness you are to help and uh, how much uh, you have a, a personal agenda that is uh, related with also the, the common good. And again, that's something that comes with you. You can show it, but also through online, it's something that you can work on it. Eh? But th this is the philosophy, then the small details on, on the how to create more trust uh, in, on remote leadership. As you said, is part of the articles that I'm going to send you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, we have another comment uh, here, Juana, and this is linked to you. They loved the, your comments on chat. So uh, they are asking if we can send them by email. And I think uh, it was a very good summary of what we yeah. have discussed, what we have written. So uh, this is, uh, if we have the email address, is, uh, address we, for sure we will send them. And also the last question that I see is, uh, what do you do when you have in your team one member who looks for improvements in every topic discussed. How do you find or keep the balance? Here, Elena, I think, uh, what do you do if just one team member is uh, searching from growth uh, on all the topics and others are not, or not very clear to me? So if you want to, to say it more clear, please do. But uh, if, if this is what uh, it is, how you, do you balance as a manager when one of the team members wants to improve a lot uh, and how you keep the balance, Luis? Well, as you know, uh, and let me relate that with culture. Right? Culture, as you know, is the behaviors that tend to be more trendy or tend to be more dominant in a company. Right? And part of uh, leadership is how to align the culture, the behaviors with uh, the strategic priorities. And as you know, one way through which you can enrich the culture is through, uh, how can I say it, is through the same as the viruses. And so it's the, there might be people in your team that uh, do have uh, influence, that happen to have a strong network of uh, people that they work with. And uh, if you're lucky, they might be also people that uh, show the right behavior. <laughs> So it's basically what I suggest is identify those people with the right behaviors, with the potential to sort of uh, to spread the virus, the, the virus of those good behaviors, train them, and eventually uh, you can create them uh, ambassadors, so to speak, of that culture of those behaviors. And then eventually, uh, you know that typically in companies, there are 20% of the company, 20% of the people that tend to be sort of very proactive, very willing to do things well and the like. And then they tend to be another 20% that are just the contrary, tend to be negative, tend to be really difficult, tend to be toxic. And then there is 60% of the people that would typically what they do is uh, watch and see, and then they end up um, aligning themselves with whom they believe will be the winner. The, the stoppers or the people that are uh, sort of uh, more willing to, to help in, the, in, the, in that path. So it's typically with uh, what I'm suggesting is with those cultural ambassadors trying to win this 60% that end up declining, who is going to win? Eh? The, the new culture or the, or the old culture, the renewed culture, the powerful culture or that toxic culture that many times is what is happening in many companies. So that's, uh, and again, we can talk about this in the course because uh, that's a great responsibility of a great leader is how to infect the organization with the right behaviors and with the right emotions. Thank you, Luis. 
this is all. We don't have any other questions. Thank you for all the participants and um, have a great evening and see you in training. Thank you also for uh, participating. Thank you, Luis, for uh, this uh, amazing uh, session. And we're looking forward to seeing you in December on uh, 6th and 7th. Yes. Uh, I, I put the link uh, for registration on uh, the chat. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the messages that you send us on uh, the social media on Facebook. Uh, thank you so much for your involvement and uh, looking forward to seeing you at our uh, next Tigro Live Talk. Uh, stay tuned for uh, more interesting uh, topics uh, with uh, our experts uh, and have a great uh, evening and uh, of course stay safe. Yes, and Joanna, Bye. please bring me to Romania, to Bucharest in 2022. Eh? That was part of the deal, okay? By all means. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye then. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>